Hello, and welcome to Central Booking, where writers and readers are the authority. I'm your host, John Valeri. April is National Poetry Month, and I'm honored to mark the occasion with Brendan Walsh, who is a poet, strongman, activist, teacher, traveler, and Connecticut native. Brendan and I first connected in 2016, when his second poetry collection, Go, was published. He has since moved to South Florida, where he teaches and writes. His most recent collection, Fort Lauderdale, was published by Graybook Press in 2019. Fellow poet Johnny Masulowitz, and forgive me if I mangled that, but he says he welcomes any and all pronunciations, noted, This collection, so short yet so pithful and tight, is nothing short of a hilarious pie in the face, but only if that pie has a piece of rusty nail-studded driftwood hidden underneath the crust. Brendan's other works include Make Anything Whole, Buddha vs. Bonobo, and The Only Flesh to Feed You. Additionally, his poems appear regularly in literary journals including Rattle, Glass Poetry, Indianapolis Review, American Literary Review, and the Baltimore Review. In addition to being a practitioner of the craft, Brendan is also an ambassador of it. In 2019, he took to the road with the Great American Poetry Crawl, connecting independent literary communities during a reading tour that spanned from Florida to Connecticut. In last month, he participated in Tupelo Press's 3030 project, composing 30 poems in as many days and raising nearly $1,000 for charities including the Florida Conservation Coalition. Having also lived and taught in South Korea and Laos, Brendan is often inspired to write about place, populace, both human and animal, and the inevitable intersection of the two. The art of poetry is his chosen medium, and now he's here to tell us why. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Central Booking. Today we are virtually traveling to Florida. It's one way to get to Florida. I'm thrilled, I haven't been there since. You know, my last visit anywhere before the pandemic was Florida. We were in yeah. Orlando, like right before we went on lockdown, but um, headed back there virtually today to visit with Brendan Walsh, who is a poet and a strong man. Now I've spoken to poets before, but you are the first strong man to appear on this show. Um, you've written five collections of poetry now, the most recent of which is Fort Lauderdale, which is available from Grey Book Press. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to talk to you. Yeah, it's it's cool to be able to do this. Um, I live in Connecticut. You lived in Connecticut a while ago. We were talking before I started taping. That was like five years ago, but we've sort of finally circled back and it seems appropriate because it's Poetry Month, April. Um, and you are the poet that I know the most, most likely. Um, <laughs> my wife told me that I should start by asking her, I was like, he's a poet. And she said, well, when did he know it? Um, but I, <laughs> I'm just going to say, you know, of all the creative or writing outlets that there are in the world, you've taken to poetry or maybe poetry's taken to you. And I'm wondering why you think that is um, and what you recall sort of of your first awareness of the craft. Uh, so... I do distinctly remember, I don't know if I knew it, but I do distinctly remember a, a second grade English, I guess it was a second grade class at Pine Grove Elementary School in Avon, Connecticut, where I grew up. And my second grade teacher, Mrs. Lynn, assigned us on that, remember that big, huge lined uh, paper oh, that yes. we would write on in elementary school to write a poem about spring like the season because it was spring and we know spring in Connecticut like right now is like the most exciting time. It really is. <laughs> Winter's almost over and uh, I, I just remember being so joyful at the idea that I could like try and describe the beauty of spring. Whatever like in my elementary school kid mind like I was like oh my god I'm gonna write about like flowers and birds and stuff and uh, I, that like I do really remember that moment because I since then, since second grade, I've always been interested in, in sounds and language, in the way that words sound, and the rhythm of, of the ways that we speak, all of that stuff. And uh, throughout like high school, I was always writing just kind of vague stuff, standard high school stuff, uh, writing my poems on paper and then stashing them away in a desk. And um, yeah, in, in college, I became very serious about it after I took a, a class called Rebel Poets with a 
wonderful poet named Carol Frost. And that was it. I mean, it's, it's always been a part of my life. It's always been a thing that I have like run to when I didn't know how to make sense of the world and organize things. I don't know why it's poetry and not something else. I mean, fiction is fun to write, but fiction for me is like a vacation. Poetry is like the work. And uh, yeah, I don't know. That, that's, I guess that's my answer. I is that succinct enough? <laughs> yeah, second grade. I'm impressed. I think the last time like I formally studied poetry was in high school and there was this whole workshop and the teacher said it was always the student's favorite of everything they've done in four years. And it was always her least favorite because everything was just so damn depressing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to get it out. Um, but all right. So let me ask you this. This is going to be a really subjective question because it will change by the person. But in your opinion, you know, what makes a good poem? And that can be writing a poem, reading a poem that speaks to you. Um, and which elements then do you try to capture in your own work? That's a great question. And one that uh, I feel intimidated trying to answer, but I'll do my best. Uh, <laughs> A, a great poem to me is, is obvious in its language, but less obvious in, in its intention, maybe. I, I really strive in my poetry for clear images in terms of, I can see that, but in, ter but in terms of like, what does this image mean? What is the purpose of this image? That's where I strive for like a bit of obscurity sure. so i mean favorite poems of mine run the gamut of like elizabeth bishop i, I truly love elizabeth bishop questions of travel uh robert hayden's those winter sundays all of these like poems that you might read in a in a college lit class those poems are the ones that have stuck with me and the ones that i return to constantly um because the images are so clear they are polished. They're not trying to be obscure in terms of their, uh, in terms of the wording or the imagery, but you extract the meaning from it. And I think that's, that's really important because that's kind of like what life is like. We see things, we observe things, but it is ultimately up to us to extract that meaning. And you can look at whatever poets look at, birds and trees, because that's what I said before, but I still look at birds and trees all the time and I'm endlessly fascinated by them. And we can think of a tree in a thousand different ways and what that means and the connection that that has to everything else around it. So yeah, I like to, I like to lay the image out there and I might have an intention, but I also want that intention to, that intention to be like not so clear. Sure. All right, so I'm gonna to try to bridge a couple of things together here and combine two of the things that you were talking about. Initially, you know, you were talking about the importance of language, um, but then also, you know, being able to create something that's accessible to the reader. And I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit more um, on poetry and language, because I know, you know, that lots of poetry can be form, but it can also be free verse. And then, you know, you were talking about wanting that relatability while still having a bit of obscurity. And there's also, you know, sort of the abstract um, versus the accessible. So can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I do find that I, I guess like you, enjoy poems that I really feel like I can relate to or at least understand um, superficially, if not beyond that. Whereas some poems I'm sure are you know, terrific and great art, but if I can't really understand what the writer is trying to tell me, then it's kind of lost on me. So I'm wondering if you can just, you can talk about language, um, accessibility versus abstract, and also, you know, when you feel like you have to have a certain form versus when you can do free verse. Yeah, I, for me, form is, is a way for even more clarity. So I love sonnets, I love haiku, I like villanelle. I, I like many of the forms because they allow me to edit myself and they allow me to strive for clarity without the clutter. And I, I oftentimes I'll write something in form and then it might end up not becoming something in form, but even just to the writing process to write a sonnet makes it clear to me in my brain. I think there's, 
I don't think I'm very intelligent. I <laughs> when you talked about abstract, like when I read something that's very abstract, like John Ashbery, I'm like, wow, smart people must really like this because I am having a really hard time getting this. Um, that might just be how my brain conceptualizes the world. Um, but I, I try to avoid abstraction unless that abstraction is universal. And I know that makes like almost no sense, but I guess to, to like consider some of the, like James Wright, for instance, he's a poet who I don't remember the name of the, uh, name of the po poem exactly, but he ends the poem with the line, I have wasted my life, which is ultimately an abstraction, but it's almost universal in terms of that feeling of, he describes in pure imagery, beautiful imagery, this, this gorgeous day. And then the last line is I have wasted my life. The feeling is universal. I don't know what he means in the poem, but I know that I love that poem. Sure. And so when I'm using abstraction, I want it to punch like that. Like I want it to be like a punch in the gut. Like, oh my God, I feel that. I don't quite understand it, but I feel that. Like that, that emotional impact is what I'm going for with abstraction. I think abstraction gives you the, the emotional impact in a way that imagery can, but maybe not always. So that like being really judicious with your abstraction and you have to earn that with imagery. Awesome. That was a really good answer to a question that I'm not even sure I understood and I'm the one who asked it, so. <laughs> well, I was just riffing, you know? I, I'm not sure about my answer either, but I'm glad you liked it. That's well, it was probably better than the question, but I guess that's the thing I love about poetry is it really can be anything because there are rules if you want there to be rules, but you can also throw all of the rules away and still present something as poetry. Um, yeah. So now the question, you know, I'm going to ask you because it's every writer's favorite question, you know, where do you get your ideas? But I do want to ask you, you know, about inspiration and whether I'm assuming, you know, it's probably some of it's conscious, some of it's, you know, unconscious, probably a combination of the two. But can you talk about, you know, where your ideas come from and how you sort of know that you have stumbled upon something that you feel the need to write about in a poem? Yeah, I think they come from my intense observation of the world. I go through phases of obsession. I think everybody does. That's why I love chapbooks. Like I, I have three chapbooks and all of these chapbooks were just the result of my like month long obsession with something. So when I become obsessed with something like many of us do, I will go on the internet and research it and watch documentaries about it. And that's, all for poems like I do that so I can write poems about it and I think that's my way of structuring the universe in my brain a little bit better mm -hmm. so the, I go through spurts month-long spurts six-week spurts of writing every single day and I treat it like a job which is part of my New England work ethic which I hate the fact that I always have to be doing something and like I have to earn it and I don't really know what I'm earning, uh, but, but I, I sit down to write every morning when I'm in one of those spells. I just did a two payload press 30 for 30 in March, and that was my work. That was the, it was all poems about God or like my understanding of God as a way of structuring the universe. And that was my obsession. So I would walk and I would look at something or I would listen to something. And I was doing that observation to ultimately write a poem about it, uh, which is not very Buddhist of me because I was doing this for a purpose rather than simply existing in the present moment. But at the same time, I kind of like the poems that I wrote. So that that's something. Oh, absolutely. I can relate to the obsessive personality. I have a lot of obsessions. They tend to be, you know, longer in duration than a month. And I wish it led to like, productivity it just doesn't like I'll become obsessed with stuff and buy all kinds of crap that I think I need and then it'll go into my office and sit there and <laughs> really stare back at me so maybe I need to rethink my life yeah <laughs> but, um, instead that's that's it you gotta yes uh, 
I'll write something. Uh, so let me ask you this. So, you know, you mentioned that a lot of your poems come about from your travels and from your observations of the world. And you really are, you know, widely traveled. South Korea, Laos, plenty of places in America. So can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how place informs your poetry and also how you feel about the written word being sort of a way for us as readers to various um, vicariously experience a place or people that we may not you know, have the fortune to do actually in person? Yeah, I think that my need for travel and my need to write kind of come from the same restlessness. Uh, when I lived in South Korea, when I, when I lived in Laos, it was this need to move, this like need to go. And through that need to go, I'm having these experiences and I need to write those experiences down. Not for anything in particular, I just know I need to write them down. So both are stemming from this restlessness. And then as I began to like write in both of these places and write consistently, I realized that I was capturing something that my memory certainly would not uh, recall especially considering, you know, the, the kind of activities I was into in South Korea. Um, they like to go out and party. And I was doing that because I was 22 years old. Um, but I could write these things down and have this, this journal, essentially, of all of these experiences, the experiences that were most important, things that photos could not capture, like the emotional essence of that time. And i was reading, I don't know, a couple months ago, for whatever reason, I had one of my older uh, collections go, the one that um, we talked about way back in 2016. And the writing is so different from what I'm experiencing now. And the emotional world is so different than what I'm experiencing now. Like I, I read that and I read it like I'm reading a moody teenager, like, oh my God, what was I? I was so like, I was really in my feelings in that time <laughs> and the craft felt different and all this stuff felt different, but that's what it like that. That's what I was experiencing. Like, I can't deny that that was the experience. And I, I think like everyone should, should do that. I think every, everybody should treat, should treat life like travel and treat that travel as something that you can record so that you can go back to and remember what that emotional experience was like. Great. I would, you know, I think a lot of times that, oh, I should have written about this, or I should have written about that or honored it in some way, because you do, you think that, how could I forget this unforgettable experience? And then, you know, a couple of years later, you realize that your memory is really quite hazy. Um, <laughs> you definitely forget it. I mean, I, uh, if I didn't write some of these things down, I'm sure they'd be lost to um, the ether, but I'm so happy that I did. I'm so happy that this is the way that I have to organize the world, organize my memory, organize my travels. Yeah, it's a nice thing to have. And I wanted to ask you about that because uh, like I mentioned, so you have five collections out, some are chapbooks, some are a little bit longer. Um, and you did say that, you know, sometimes you go sort of through obsessive phases where you know that there is a topic that you want to really explore in depth for a certain period of time. Um, but you know, a lot of times I think that poems probably exist on their own too. So I was wondering if you can talk um, and reflecting on the collections that you have out, how you see your poetry is, you know, standing alone, but also making some kind of collective whole. And if you yeah. want to use, uh, Fort Lauderdale as a point of reference, just because I know that a lot of those pieces were published elsewhere before they were collected um, in this work. So obviously, you know, there's an overarching theme, um, but you've done a lot with those poems besides this one collection. Yeah, I think that as I developed uh, my writing more, I worked, I saw them as individual pieces and as part of the whole. So yeah, I do consider when I'm writing, how will this stand alone? And sometimes there are pieces that won't stand alone. And those are the things that you just have to like sneak into the manuscript uh, once it's accepted or, uh, you know, bookended by these more powerful standalone pieces. Um, but the Fort Lauderdale, I think is, I mean, you always like what you most recently wrote, right? So Fort Lauderdale, I think, I think is the strongest because it does a good job of doing 
both of those things, having these standalone pieces that anyone could read at any time and connect with, and those pieces that are necessary to push the narrative of the chapbook further. Um, even though it's only 20, it's like 20 poems, something like that, but uh, I think that there are several pieces that would not stand alone, and there are, and there are many others that do. In my little chat book about animal mating uh, called The Only Flesh to Feed You, that was one of those obsessive times where I was, um, I needed to write poems about animal mating. I don't know why. I was, became obsessed with animal mating rituals. And uh, I think each of those stand alone because they're very singular. They do make up the whole, but they're not connected. They're connected thematically in that they're animals having sex. But other than that, there's no, you right. know, they all stand alone. So yeah, I, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I do consider it now. And part of me wants to write some chat books that are, completely dependent on every poem that came before and after it. And then there's times where I just, I write a really good poem and I try to fit that in somewhere else. So I think I'm doing both simultaneously. I have like three manuscripts right now that I'm kind of working on or shopping around and they're all doing different things. Overachiever, that's what we call you. Oh, you <laughs> I get that spot. That obsessive compulsive. <laughs> you kind of know it happens. <laughs> no, it's cool too. Though. I like how you're saying, you know, sometimes you just slide things in that may not be, um, I don't know, what people would perceive as the best or the greatest poem. But I feel like a lot of times you talk to musical artists, songwriters, and they say that it's, you know, the B-sides or the album cuts that a lot of people never even hear that they would say is probably their best and most important work. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, when I got uh, that Go, when Go was accepted for publication, I was reading through it. There are a lot of poems in it. Uh, the only thing that I remember saying was like, oh, I'm so happy that these poems that haven't been published get to be published because I really like these ones. That, that was it. Like, I was just trying to find a home for like my <laughs> other babies that like didn't get accepted in other places. Sure, sure. It's always those ones, it seems that, you know, those are the ones that stick in the mind of the person who wrote it. Um, yeah. But, so let me ask you, I want to ask you about the relationship between writing um, and rewriting. Is there a typical, you know, time frame or process that you go through before you know that a poem is ready to see an audience that's broader than just yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I as I said, like, I, I compose pretty regularly, especially in these spurts. So after I write, sometimes you just know that it's almost there. And then other times it sits for a week and I'll go back to it or I'll look at it every morning or every night because I know that you know we're, we're getting there but it's not quite there. And other times it just seems to work and it just requires um, some reading. I read aloud all of the time. So like reading these things aloud makes everything so much clearer, especially poems because poems like if, if something is out of place, it's gonna be obvious when you say it out loud. Um, so the, the things that are, how do I know if it's ready is just kind of, I've read a lot. I think that's it. I just, I have the ear and eye for it now that I know like, okay, this is what I want to sound like with other people's poems. It's a little bit more difficult because you don't know exactly what they're looking for. But, uh, yeah, with me, it's all about the ear. It's all about hearing it out loud, uh, through my own reading. Because I'm more of like a, 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 I don't know, audio. I'm sure auditory. Yeah. <laughs> auditory. Yeah. I should know that I'm a teacher. No, um, no yeah. I'm, you're <laughs> human. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I'm an auditory uh, guy with poetry. Like I need to hear it. I need to hear the music of it. And sometimes you just write and you're like, wow, that hits. Like that's what it is. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. Oh, yeah. It's rare. It's rare, but like it happens. And when it happens, that's a great feeling. Other times I'm reading it every day out loud, cutting stuff out. I love to cut out like big chunks. I love to kill stuff uh, in my poems because it just feels like cleaning out like a dirty house, like getting rid of all that clutter. Um, and people are afraid to do that. But when you do it, it feels good and it feels clean. And that's what I'm looking for. It's great. And so I wanted to um, 
you know, sort of elaborate on sharing your work, because I know that you do a lot of readings and it's almost in a way like performance art. And I wanted to ask you about that, you know, one, allowing yourself sort of to be comfortably vulnerable in front of people when so much is created in isolation. Uh, and then also performance just really being an aspect of a, of a poetry reading, if you wouldn't mind talking about that. Yeah, I love reading poems. Like I love performing. I was really into acting as a kid. I was like a very gregarious drama kid. And I, I always loved performing. I didn't really like acting as much as I liked performing. So poetry allowed me to, to sort of inhabit the poem in a way that maybe I, I was unable to inhabit characters. Um, so it, it's sort of like that. For me, it's really cathartic. I, I love to read poems. I'm, you know, known for crying in front of audiences. Uh, I definitely do that. I've done that multiple times in front of like absolute strangers and people that are close to me because that's like actually what I'm seeking. I, I don't mean to cry, but I, when it happens, that feels like, oh, that's why I wrote this poem because I felt something so strongly that I wrote it down and I crafted it and I tried to make it something uh, that would like commemorate this feeling, whatever this feeling is. Um, so in terms of like when it's composed privately, how to make it public, sometimes I have written things that I'm like, I can't share this with anyone. Uh, the, the things that I choose to read are things that, that have like deep emotional impact and might be quite personal but I've also gone through the process of like thinking about, okay, in reading this, what am I trying to accomplish? Like, is this for an audience or is this something I wrote because I needed to write? So I, I definitely still, I filter it. And I think that if people want to read in front of, in front of others, they, they should acknowledge that an audience changes the game because it's not only your poem. If you read it to an audience, it's the audience's poem too, assuming that they connect with it. So yeah, you have to be careful. And I think that's always, you know, interesting, too, in talking to creatives who say, you know, once it leaves you and finds an audience, it's, it's whatever, you know, they see, whatever they need it to be, whatever they want it to be, and it sort of takes on a life of its own, which is just, you know, interesting, because a lot of times you have an idea of what you're trying to convey when you write it, and somebody else can have a completely different um, interpretation, but I think that's kind of the fun of it, too, right? It is, yeah, I mean, I think it's amazing. I think it's, like, so cool. It's so cool. I mean, humans have amazing tools at our disposal. Clearly language is our most useful and horrifying mm -hmm. and just like godlike tool. And so this, this ability that we have as communicators and, and not just like writers, like anybody to, to shape reality in someone's mind through the reality that you've shaped in your own mind is like, it's baffling. It's baffling that we get to do this. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's really cool. And I love that the work, you know, lives on far after uh, we're gone. Um, oh, I wanted to ask you, so obviously, you know, you are a practitioner of the craft, but I would also say you're sort of an ambassador of it because, you know, you have taken to the road with poetry in the past. You do a lot to bring um, your poetry to other people and then also to bring people to poetry. So I was wondering, you know, if you can talk about that, maybe, you know, your Great American Poetry Crawl that you did in 2019 um, or the, fundraise, the fundraising campaign you actually already mentioned that you did with uh, Tupelo Press a couple of times in the past. Yeah, I think it's super exciting to to like connect with people who kind of don't really know how they feel about poetry. That's, that's like the audience that I want. I, I, of course I love poetry lovers and other poets. Those are the people that you're most likely going to interact with at a poetry reading. But the fact that I have such a disparate group of people in my life who maybe aren't so sure about poetry, who haven't connected with it, to know that I've connected with them is really exciting. I think to use the word ambassador is incredibly generous. I'm, uh, you know, I try, but I do think it, ha it has worked to some extent. And it's really strange to see, to use the example of you mentioned like strongman, some like jockish strongman kind of guy 
come up to me after a reading and be like, yeah, that, that really like that hit me, that poem that you read, like is first of all, absurd and beautiful and like adorable that um, people are willing to be vulnerable. And I think part of an ambassadorship is vulnerability and putting yourself out there. I'm lucky that I've been able to do this. I think it's like an, ex uh, an extension of my privilege that I have been able to do things like the Great American Poetry Crawl to have like so many people support me and to have so many people donate to my Tupelo Press campaign. I view that as like a privilege. I view that as like, I have amazing people who read my work and who are friends with me and, and my family. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I can take any credit for it. I just think that there are some amazing people that I happen to have connected with in my life. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Um, and I wanted to ask you too, you know, the Tupelo Press fundraiser, obviously, uh, you know, you did it for a great cause, but it's basically, you know, you have a month and you have a poem every day for that month. And so, you know, before I was asking you how long you sit with a poem, but obviously when you do something like that, um, it's much more immediate and immersive. Do you find that it's more liberating to write in that way just because you can't sit with something for an extended period of time? Yeah, I do. I think of that uh, clock is really exciting because I had to submit a poem. I had to send a poem through email every day. And so I got in the habit of doing it at, I mean, I'd write it whatever five in the morning and have the poem out by, by six in the morning. And it was very liberating because it's not about, oh, I'll look at this later. Or like, is this worthy of publication? I know that it's going to be read. I know that people are going to have their eyes on it. So yeah, I mean, in some ways you think maybe I want to take fewer risks. And then in other ways you think, well, like, what does this risk really mean? Like, what am I actually risking? This is a poem. It's not like I'm, I don't have my finger on any sort of like button. Like, it's just, I'm just writing a poem. <laughs> so yeah, it was liberating. I, I really loved it. I, it's one of those things that I immediately thought that I wanted to do again, but um I'm going to take a step back for a second and work with what I wrote just to like see what I have, but I'm definitely, I will definitely do it again. And I would encourage anyone who has the opportunity to do it. Awesome. And I wanted to ask you too, you know, you mentioned that sometimes other strong men show up at your poetry performances <laughs> um, and, you know, people who know you or know you through social media know that you do all kinds of really cool stuff. Like you can basically, you could probably lift me over your head on a finger, spin me around and toss me half the across the world. Um, talents I will never have. But I wanted to ask you what you feel about the relationship sort of between physical health um, and emotional health. And if you find that even though they seem to be sort of disparate disciplines that you're writing and what you do um, more physically actively, if there's a relationship between the two. Yeah, there definitely is a relationship. I think for me, it's all part of the, of my practice. It's about discipline. I don't, like, I'm not a disciplinarian for other people, but for myself, I'm, like, very, very, like, strict about the, how I use my time, especially in the mornings. I, I mention morning a lot because that's, like, my most productive time. Afternoon, I'm, like, useless, but uh, in the morning, in the morning is when I write my poems and when I do my exercise, so it need, that, that process of uh, subjecting yourself to things that are uncomfortable, like writing. Like writing can be incredibly uncomfortable, especially when you have nothing that you think you can say. It's like much harder than doing a weight workout, honestly, because the weights are just there. You can move them. They're dumb. Uh, they just kind of sit there and you move them. Poetry is like the, the harder struggle, but both are struggles. And through that struggle, there's this clarity. The, the flow state is like one way people put it. Writing and lifting are the things that allow me to achieve flow state. And that's when it feels like, okay, like I'm alive. Like I am, I am grappling with, with the universe and consciousness and whatever God is, and I understand it. And then, I don't know, around 1 p.m. It's like, none of this makes sense anymore. 
but for for those like mornings when things are just like buzzing 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 along like i've written and i'm and i've lifted um that's when it makes sense to me so i think the connection for me is like so obvious that uh when people sort of i know that they are disparate but when people like phrase them as that i'm like what are you talking about like these are the exact same thing but they're not at all <laughs> like i understand that but like in my brain it's the same feeling writing a good poem and like whatever maxing out on a lift like that feels the same to me like that's exciting i know my mind is like wow get up in the morning write and do that and then work a real job like whoa but <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I also I'm why you do it in the morning because you know if i don't get up early to get stuff done it, it doesn't happen <laughs> exactly exactly that's exactly how i feel like i can't do stuff in the afternoon it's impossible sure all right, a couple more questions and then I will let you get back to life. You know, you're very kind to take time out to do this. I um, wanted to ask you because you are a teacher, you know, I just assume I never actually asked you, you know, what you teach. Who knows? Maybe it's like ceramics, but I just assume it's writing and poetry. Um, I yeah, right. <laughs> um, so it is writing, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So you know, not to open Pandora's box or anything, but I wanted to ask you, you know, what do you feel? And again, very subjective can be taught versus what might be intrinsic to the person. And then really just how important is it finding, you know, an environment that you're comfortable in that will foster some kind of growth for a person? Uh, I think, I think the only quality that someone needs in order to be uh, an effective writer is willingness to read and to be open. That That is like legitimately it. I don't think it's some profound gift I think that there are people who are sort of they have their thing that they do and they're sort of they have the blinders on and they and they they do that I think that writing requires this openness to experience to the way that people sound and the things that people say you have to open your eyes you have to open your ears you have to like be quiet you have to be okay with being quiet um and that's it and be to be able to read that's it. Read and take criticism and be open. Then the writing will come. It will, it will look different with every person, but that, that's something I try to stress to, to students is like, read a lot and listen and be open and you'll, you'll make something that, that you're proud of. And that's good. In terms of environment, I, I went to, I got my MFA at Southern Connecticut State University uh, in beautiful New Haven, which, uh, you know, city I love. And that environment was so important for me. And I'm speaking specifically about my graduate level poetry workshop that I had one per semester for four semesters. And each of those workshops are some of the greatest writing, like, community times I've had in my entire life. I just remember like reading and laughing so much, like laughing to the point where I couldn't breathe anymore and just feeling like so, so free. And, and, and that's what tied me to continuing on in this career, whatever, you know, we can call a poetry career. Uh, so that community was important. And that's a community that like, I'm, I'm still seeking that community afterwards. Like it was important, but I haven't found something like it. And if I could find that in my right now life, that would be a game changer because I think community and environment are incredibly important. My guess is you're probably creating it for other people, you know? I hope so. I, I, I hope. I also be love that <laughs> you talk about the importance of reading because I always find it astounding, you know, um, people who say they want to write and then you say, well, what do you read? And they say, I don't. And it's like, oh. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So you're not going to be writing very well. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. A couple more. So I wanted to ask you, if you don't mind, sort of about the pandemic, because obviously we're sort of we're living in, you know, uncertain times, unprecedented times. Have you found that your relationship with reading or writing has changed due to the circumstances? And if so, how have you adapted to what is our sort of new normal? Yeah, I think that I've written quite a bit but all of my writing kind of views the pandemic as a, a thing that is happening that is not central. 
it's just a thing in the background. And that background might be really noisy, but it's not the thing itself. So a lot of my pandemic poems are about loneliness because I felt a ton of loneliness, sort of living alone, being out of the classroom for that whole uh, first, what was it, March to, like March to July was just like, oh my God, like I felt so isolated. But it also gave me time because I wasn't going to campus to walk outside every morning around like sunrise. And I was able to connect with this environment that I love that maybe I haven't had the chance to because I've been so busy. And now I'm busy again. And I, I actually had pandemic, like quarantine uh, nostalgia the other day. And it like astonished me because it's the exact same time of year right now that I was like, oh, I'm miserable. I'm so lonely. I can't believe it. I'm, I'm just like the saddest person in the entire world. And then the other day I was like, but it was really nice to get out in the morning and go for a walk and like have some coffee to not have to teach constantly, not have to go to the gym. Um, so in that way, it was kind of like freeing, like it, it freeing in a way that I didn't realize at the time, which is often how we filter like memory, right? Like I didn't realize how much I needed that experience and how important it was for me, even though it was terrible and, and I hated it and it was isolating and all that stuff, it was also necessary. Um, and now, I don't know, have I forgotten all of that? <laughs> it happened so forgotten? quickly, it's weird, you know? It you really did. <laughs> We're 13 months in now, right. since, the, since the, like, the day of the, of the quarantine and, um, yeah, I, I can't believe it has been a year. And I think so much great stuff has happened with my writing and, uh, and my reading and the things that I read and how I read and how I write. All that stuff has been great. But this year has also been like a crazy blur. Really mm -hmm. has. There's that time thing again. It just... Yeah, it, mind blowing. Like what? <laughs> it's been... Yeah. I feel like I wake up that that way every day. What? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's crazy. All right, I'm going to wind down. Two last questions, I promise. But I know a lot of times, um, you know, aspiring writers might tune in and they're always looking for, you know, thoughtful suggestions. So in sort of reflecting on your career, um, in terms of a creative or writing a, a life, you know, what is the best advice you think that you've ever been given? And then the best advice that you were never given and sort of had to learn for yourself and wish that maybe you knew a little bit sooner? Hmm. The best advice. That's a, that's a fantastic question. I, I, I like one thing immediately came to my mind and it is something that I, that I take to heart every time I write. There's this poet named Michael Waters who uh, was a faculty member at a workshop that I worked at called Catskill Poetry Workshop where I was an intern when I was 20 years old and he's a very really pretty famous poet there are a lot of famous poets there like Stephen Dunn who's a Pulitzer Prize winner I was meeting all of these people and it was incredible and at one workshop Michael Waters was talking about uh, a poem one of my other one of the other young people there and he said break their fucking hearts and in my writing, like I take that to heart every time I write something. It doesn't mean that the poem can't be like funny and can't have like a lighthearted message, but it has to, it has to go for the heart. Like it has to go for emotion. Uh, a poem can't live in sort of like, lim in my opinion, it cannot live in liminal space. Like it has to break your fucking heart. And if it doesn't, then I, then in terms of like what I write, like it has not succeeded. Like I want, I want it to feel like that. And, and when I read poems, I want that. I want it to be like, like, I want to feel like my breath is like kind of taken away. So that advice for, for writing to, to linger on that emotion and to like not be scared to go for the gut punch, because that's, that's part of why we read. Um, in terms of this life and this lifestyle, there's not enough time to, to be afraid or to question uh, your fears of rejection and all of that stuff. Like you're gonna get rejected. It will happen so much for so long. And then all of a sudden 
you won't be rejected or you'll get a nice rejection letter. And then you realize that you're on the right track and just get used to it. Like get used to it. I still get rejections all the time. Um, but I get fewer now, fewer now than ever before. <laughs> so that's like, that means that I'm moving in the right direction, but no fear. Like you can't, you can't be afraid of this. It's, it's low stakes. I know it doesn't feel like it's, it's low stakes. It feels like it's really high stakes. Cause you're like, that's my heart that I'm giving to you. And you're telling me it's not good enough, but like, it's a poem or it's a story. Yes. It's your heart, but like, it's also a work in progress. Like your heart, your heart's a work in progress too. So like, don't be afraid. That's it excellent advice because like we were talking about that idea of time you know it passes so quickly and then you look back and you realize how trivial you know some of these things that were holding you back really were um, yeah so that's great advice and of course i have to ask you to wrap things up i always like to get a little teaser of what people are working on um i know some people tend to be superstitious and don't want to talk about the things that aren't yet uh so if that's you that's fine but you know you mentioned you have like three other manuscripts that you're sort of shopping around um so i'm wondering if you want to tell us about you know what obsessions have been compelling you to write more recently Sure. I mean, so one that I'm super excited about is I had a, a prose poem chapbook that won the Elsewhere chapbook um, prize. That was last week, I think I found that out. Yeah, I found that out last week, maybe, or maybe two weeks ago. I don't quite remember. It was a few weeks ago, but that is called Concussion Fragment, and that's sort of grappling with uh, toxic masculinity and, and sort of like the violence that young men are, are told to, to stomach for their entire lives. And then uh, it, it deals with that. It also deals with a bunch of head injuries that I had as a kid. Um, so that that's one that will be out, I don't know when, probably next year through Elsewhere Press. Uh, the other one that I'm really excited about that has not found a home, but I hope one day will, is called Not Just Yet, Not Just Yet. And that is all about death. Uh, which is a great thing to write about if you're a poet, because that is the obsession. That is the constant obsession. Of course. Um, and it's, it, it's about, I mean, I, I have some poems about like friends that have died, um, but, but also uh, just my own developing understanding of, of death and mortality and, and how that has, how that has shifted into something that is not negative anymore. Um, and yeah, those, those are my two chapbooks right now. I also have all those God poems that I wrote for Chapello Press. I'm, I'm going to put those together, uh, one of these days, hopefully soon and, and see what happens with that and see what I can, can extract from all those poems. Like I have 30, so that's something, that's a chapbook right there. Oh yeah, totally. Most excellent. See, look how quickly it happens. So people should sign up for that challenge and then they have, yeah. you know, no, no option not to produce. <laughs> exactly. 30, 30 poems. It's like, that's more than a lot of people write in, in several years. So to have it done in a month and have something to work with, have that clay to shape into whatever is, is awesome. See, you do shape clay. <laughs> yeah, I, I would. I, I had a student who was taking a ceramics class tell me he was going to ceramics. And I just felt so, this, this morning, I was like, I am so jealous. Like, I wish I could go to ceramics class right now. <laughs> that sounds so therapeutic and nice. Well, there you go. Well, Brendan Walsh, thank you so much for taking time out to celebrate Poetry Month and to sort of look back on your career and your accomplishments. It was really cool getting to catch up with you and I wish you continued success. Thank you so much, John. You too. This has been awesome. And I really appreciate talking to you. That's it for this episode of Central Booking. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing.